you're about to learn what it takes to beat 99% of pickleball players. And the best part is, you don't even have to go drill a new technique for 100 hours to actually use it in your game. Because we're talking strategy today. There are eight key techniques we're going to cover, so stick around till the end right after you subscribe. The first and probably most basic strategy is pushing your opponents back. This one seems the simplest on the surface, but actually has a lot of layers to unpack. So let's start with why you need to push your opponents back in the first place. The most obvious reason is that there's now more court the ball has to travel through. That means your job of reading the pickleball just got a lot easier. Because more court means more time to react to any shot your opponent throws your way. On top of that, it naturally puts you on the offensive. Whoever holds the kitchen line is usually controlling the point. So if you become the only team there, you're naturally going to have a lot more opportunities to attack rather than play defensive. But just because we know that we should push them back doesn't mean that we know how to do it. So here are some techniques to help you. Again, we'll start simple. Hit deep serves and hit deep returns. Just by aiming farther into the court, you start every point with more time to take the kitchen line and or react to your opponent. But even after a good start, you'll often end up in a situation where both teams have made it to the kitchen line. The good news is, you can still push them back even from here. Hit aggressive dinks and shots at their feet, which forces them to back up and play defensive. If you can keep up the pressure, you'll be forcing them off the line and once again taking the offensive. Just be careful to avoid hitting your shots too high. That can easily lead to them retaliating instead. A final option to try out sparingly is the use of power. If you can hit the ball hard, your opponent will naturally want more time to react to your shots. This means they'll often back up on their own off the kitchen line when they anticipate a hard drive coming at them. The best scenario to add some pace is when you receive a short ball around the midcourt. Aim at your opponent's body or ideally the right shoulder, which forces them to either back up or take the shot head on. Again though, be careful with this technique. It's very easy to overswing and lose the point outright. But with good execution on all these tips, you can push your opponents back from anywhere on the court. Now in a similar vein, let's talk about using speed ups for strategy number two. But warning, before we cover this, maybe don't use them in your local rec play. Speed ups are for more competitive play and you don't wanna be that guy out on the pickleball court. But with that out of the way, let's talk about how to use speed ups effectively. The first and most common time to speed up the ball is when you're at the kitchen line. You're looking for an opponent who starts to lose focus and doesn't seem ready. Then all of a sudden send a ball flying at them. Typically, this happens in a long dink rally where one player isn't engaged. Instead of keeping that rally going, try speeding up the ball at the sleeping player. They'll likely either outright miss or pop up the ball, which means you've got to put away. Another great time to speed up the ball is when you get a dink that's too defensive and bounces up high. Whenever a dink bounces up high, you've got more margin to hit the ball with pace without it flying out. So take the opportunity and launch a ball ideally at the right shoulder or an open space of the court. A third place we would recommend trying a speed up is a short high ball in the midcourt. We mentioned earlier how this ball pushes your opponents back, but there's other ways to use it if your opponent doesn't budge. Find a weak spot and force a pop up. Down the line is usually a great option if you can hit their backhand. In the middle also works if they don't have it covered. Even just a low ball to an opponent's chest can force a jam. You should evaluate your situation and pick a target before swinging at these. Otherwise, they could block it back at your feet, which reverses the outcome. Now let's cover some ways to exploit a situation where your opponent is the one speeding up. You're about to learn how to set up and exploit gaps for tip three. A situation you'll find yourself in often at a high level is a gap in the middle. This can happen in a dink rally when your partner gets pushed too far out wide, which leaves a gap in the middle. If your opponent is smart, they'll take advantage by speeding up the ball in the middle to the now open court. But don't just let that ball fly by. Instead, capture the middle and retaliate. Another one to look out for is the partner back scenario. A really strong serve can occasionally force your partner to stay back after returning rather than approaching the kitchen. Usually it's because they didn't have enough time to run to the kitchen and take the offensive. A smart opponent will spot the returner who stayed back and attempt to drive the ball at their feet. An even smarter player will see the situation unfolding and take advantage. Expect the drive and push the ball for a counterattack. One more likely scenario to watch for is a weak return. When your partner hits a return that bounces too high or lands short in the court, your opponent will want to attack. Typically, they are going to look for a gap to drive the ball through. Try baiting them into attacking the wrong spot. When your opponent has a ball that sits up, pretend to poach middle and then move back to your line at the last second. Leaving your line briefly will give your opponent what they think is an open target. 
then you can move back and counter instead. Reading these common situations catches 99% of players off guard, especially when they think they're the ones that are attacking. You won't always find yourself in a situation to set up a counter attack. That's why you also need to predict what your opponent is about to do in all situations. If that seems impossible, just wait. We're about to show you the most common signals that give away your opponent's next shot for tip number four. We'll start with the paddle. Simply the position of your opponent's paddle tells you what they're about to do most of the time. When their paddle lowers toward the court, they're about to hit a roll shot or a soft shot. When their paddle goes up, they're about to smash or a volley. If your opponent is taking a large backswing, they're going to add pace to the ball. If they barely pull the paddle back, they intend to block or hit a soft shot. Just by eyeing down your opponent's paddle during the match, you can be ready for any shot that comes your way. But we won't stop there. Let's move on to body language. If they lose focus and slouch during a long point, they aren't expecting a speed up to come at them. If they take a step back off the kitchen line to hit a ball, they're probably speeding it up. If their eyes focus on a particular spot before they swing, they're probably going to hit it there. This obviously is a lot to take in and we don't expect you to memorize every possible signal. That's not why we're sharing it. We want you to become an active observer that sees the situation before it happens. Every time you're caught off guard, take note of what your opponent did before they hit their shot. You'll soon find commonalities in all of your matches to turn you into a master of prediction. Tip five is all about the middle. We've talked a lot about predicting your opponent's moves, but sometimes the hardest moves to predict are from your teammate. The middle of the court is prime real estate for putaways, so giving it up or using it incorrectly just isn't an option. The problem is that everyone likes to put away the ball, which means it's easy for partners to clash when it comes to the middle. The best way to fix this is to set a precedent right at the beginning of your match. Just say, hey, forehand gets middle. I got it. That way, whoever has their forehand in the middle can step over and take the ball for themselves. Also, don't be afraid to step several feet into your partner's court to make that happen. The worst thing you can do is to make a move to take the ball and then realize at the last second you'd rather not step all the way into your partner's court to take the shot. You'll just confuse your partner and give up the point. Of course, this has a limit. Don't take a shot that your partner could very easily reach, but most players don't step far enough into the middle. But what if you're playing with a lefty? If you've got two forehands in the middle, then there's two things to keep in mind. Number one is play the X. Whichever player has a ball coming cross court toward them should take the ball in the middle. And number two is talk. If you're not sure who should go, call it. Just say, I got it, or you got it, and commit to your call. It's that easy. Speaking of communication, let's talk about hand signals for number six. Communicating covertly with your partner is a huge advantage, so let's cover how to do that. There's different variations, but we'll cover our favorite and easiest to understand. When you're in front, place your hand behind your back or behind your paddle for your partner to see. Then pick one of the three options. A closed fist means stay. This signals that your partner should return cross court and approach the kitchen right after as usual. An open hand means switch. Your partner should return down the line and then approach the kitchen while switching positions with you. Typically, you do this when you have a player with a stronger forehand in the middle. Finally, a talking hand motion means fake. Your partner returns down the line and pretends to switch, then backs off at the last second. If you haven't tried these, we definitely recommend going for it. They can be a huge advantage on the court. Okay, moving on, most teams are going to have a stronger player and it's important to maximize them. It's not about one player shining. It's about leveraging their strengths for the team's advantage. We're going to show you some great ways to create opportunities and open up the court for tip number seven. The first thing you should do is give the stronger player middle whenever possible. This will create more opportunities to attack and limit your opponent's ability to target the weaker player. For example, let's say a ball is coming toward the middle near a strong player's forehand. The right player should shift toward the right to make room for the left player. Then the left player can step in and attack without worrying about running into a partner. This also works from the baseline. If a ball comes deep in the middle or even a little bit in the right player's court, give up space and let the strong player assist. But the better player won't always be on the correct side to take middle. So what do you do when your optimal positions are swapped? It's simple, switch them back. Try stacking during a serve or using the hand signals we taught you earlier to switch on returns. Do what you can to set up the right court positions on every point. And lastly, a strong player is only as good as their partner's ability to set them up. The less dominant player should create opportunities by forcing opponents to hit at their teammate. At the kitchen, try aiming cross court and pushing your opponents back and wide. Eventually, the opponent's safer option will be to hit a defensive dink down the line. This can set up a put away just like that. On drives or drops, target the opponent that's directly in front of the stronger player. This gives them less space to hit away from the strong player and creates chances to poach if they still try to hit cross court. Knowing how to work as a team is the best strategy in pickleball, so try these out. For the final tip, let's give you one more great strategy to try out to utilize that teamwork. 
you're gonna learn the shake and bake. A shake and bake is when one player hits a drive and their partner poaches the next shot. To set this up, you're going to need a bit of power and subtle communication. Whenever a player with a strong drive gets the chance to rip a ball from the baseline, they can say go to their partner. The partner should then advance to the kitchen line as fast as possible and get ready. The player driving the ball aims at the opponent directly in front of their teammate, then send it straight to their body. The opponent will pop up the ball, which leads to an immediate poach by the partner. For this to work, the drive has to be strong and the partner has to be ready. That's why communication is key. Try this strategy out, especially if the other team has slow reflexes. You'll win a lot of free points and keep your opponents on their toes. Now you know the eight essential strategies to take down 99% of players. If you liked this video, you should strategically subscribe to our newsletter, where we drop tips on a regular basis. And now you should check out this video that YouTube thinks you should watch right now.